Hey, Jennifer Lee, how the heck are you? I'm great, Mike. How are you? I'm fantastic. And you know why I'm fantastic? Because we're back. Episode three, season six of Haven's Measure Twice, Cut Once. Boy, time flies when you're having fun. Yeah, and I'm really excited this season because we're exploring Haven's award winners. I'm really excited to get to know kind of the guts and the inner workings of the projects and the people behind them. Oh, absolutely. You know, we tend to see the finished results and the awards and the lights and all that other stuff. We don't see a lot about the process that goes into it. This week, we have a, a really exciting conversation in a slightly different vein, but some great people. And uh, I'm really excited about today's conversation. Yeah, let's welcome them. I already know Matt really well, but we have Matt Yuck and uh, we also have Carly, Carly McLeod from Carly Christina Designs. And Matt, you have a family business, which I always am interested in because that's what I'm from and you have Mar Craft Homes. Yes, right. thank you. Yeah, very, thank you very much. <laughs> I was like, oh, hold on. I was like, did I screw it up? You looked at me no. blank. And I was like, <laughs> Uh, but yes, which, um, you know, we could get into, I know your sister well, who is a mm -hmm. realtor and I know your whole family business, just like mine. So mm -hmm. let's get all the listeners up to date and let's learn a little bit more about Matt. How did you get into construction? Because I'm going to assume it's the same thing as how my brother and I got in no choice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, f basically, right. Um, I started as a really young guy sitting at the coffee table with my dad and there was always a set of plans out on the kitchen table. So I'd spend a lot of time looking and kind of visualizing the floor plans and everything. Back then, my dad had a company called Calais Homes, and uh, he actually built like full on subdivisions. So he would do like a, the ribbon cutting and we'd walk through on like on a Saturday and he had like a whole cul-de-sac of houses and uh, then got into some like Street of Dream houses and stuff like that. So I got like really interested in all the cool things that you could do with homes and uh it just kind of became something that I was really interested in. And then it got into, you know, cleaning job sites, right? As a kid on the weekend. We've all done that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, then it got into a little, the harder stuff, like the concrete work and some framing work. And then I realized if I stuck in the concrete for life, I, I feel like the body was going to break down pretty, pretty fast. Right. So I decided to go to uh, BCAT, Architecture and Building Engineering Technology. Um, got my diploma in that. And then uh, as soon as I was out, I actually started building some houses in Amma with my with my father. Which so. I've been through some of them. They're mm -hmm. gorgeous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to mention, you are also a realtor, which is kind of a rare combo. Yeah, the real estate, I mean, I, I figured I'd pick that up, um, you know, along the way. What was happening for me, actually, was, uh, you know, I'd spend two and a half years to build a home. And uh, some of these homes would sell in like a day or two. So I kind of felt like there was a, an opportunity there that I felt like, I'd like to, you know, get a hold of as well. But, but the, I, I'd imagine yeah. you'd have mm -hmm. some very unique insight as well, because yeah. one of the things we talk about is if you're looking at a home, take your builder with your real estate agent, yeah. and now we can take you and have one efficient conversation, right? Yeah, I mean, the conversations flow. I mean, you can go in there and you talk about renovating a home, and then you talk about how much the cost of renovating a home. You talk about new construction and what that looks like. And then maybe at the end of the conversation, they might say, you know, well, why don't we list this and then go and buy a lot and start from fresh or, you know, so there's three different avenues you can go into. So with uh, myself and my team, we could sort of pick up all those aspects. And Carly, let's get it over to you now. How did you get into interior design? Because... I was always asked that question because I come from a building family, but I you not trust me with paint colors. So I'm <laughs> sure that you have a better reason of why you got in. Well, I kind of similar to Matt, I feel like I was exposed to just some family renovations with their houses. And I thought it was just so fascinating to see what this slate was to begin with and then what it could be transformed into. So I think that captivated me right away. And yeah, I always found myself just watching so many interior design shows and being so intrigued in the process. And growing up, I would always be changing my bedroom around. Like I probably changed it around, I don't know, at least five times where I full on like would paint and <laughs> redecorate. And I would even find myself saving money as a young girl and wanting to put that money towards like a new bed. And when most kids would just be buying toys with that or something. My mom would always say that I had the nicest room in the house because I really put a lot of time towards that. And then when it came time for me trying to figure out what to do for a living, it was pretty easy for me to make that decision and the rest is history. 
I'm so yeah. jealous that you were allowed to paint your room. I know. It was actually kind of cool because I don't think I would let my kids do that. But my mom just gave me free range. And I I basically be, was able to express my um, my interests and, and who I really was through my space, which is ultimately what interior design is all about. So, yeah. And how many years have you been doing this? Oh, my gosh. I've been – well, when I was in – I went to BCIT in 2007 – and I kind of was always involved in having some sort of job that related to the industry. So since then, and then I've been, I started my own company. This is my 10th year in business. So. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Congratulations. And your first time winning an award, which yes. is a really big deal. Some I people know. go their whole careers without being able to win one yeah. of those. Yeah, It's been a really exciting milestone and year for me because I, I've actually, um, my husband's career was has always been the focus because he was a professional hockey player. Oh, wow. And I somehow managed to have my own business at the same time and, and establish myself during his career. But when he finally retired, I was just like, okay, this is my time to shine and I'm going all in and I'm not going to let anything hold me back and just see where it takes me. Lovely. And I just want yeah. to congratulate you right now on your award, which is Best Interior Design Custom Residence. Thank so you. congrats to you. Thank and you. Matt, um, I feel like I should be cheersing you with something. I but know. there we go. Cheers that with works water. The water. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it's really exciting. Well, and it just underscores that it takes a team to win these totally. awards and no one of us can win by ourselves. We need a great group of people around that. And that's what a lot of this conversation yeah. is about. I do have one question for you, Carly, and I'm always intrigued when I meet with designers is how the heck do you look at a room that's an empty room and decide like, how do you, where do you draw your inspiration from? Right. Yeah. That's always the question is how do you figure this stuff out? What do you, what do you do to go, okay, we'll be this or it'll be that. Yeah. Well, it's kind of funny because at the end of the job, it was a really cool experience because the homeowners had us a part of them seeing the house for the first time. And after 10 years, it was the first time that has ever been the case for me where we really celebrated this exciting chapter for them. And we had a bottle of champagne for every level. And at the end, Matt, you were saying like, how did you foresee this like it's just so fascinating that you put this all together and it started just on paper and then this is what it created and um ultimately it really does start though first with who is the client and what is your your interests and who are you authentically as a person because i think a lot of the times people get so caught up in trends and following what's in but in reality, your home really should be a self-reflection of who you are. And my it's my job to pull all of that out in the most authentic way to represent you as an individual, not to follow what's popular. And I think that's ultimately what creates a timeless space. But it's all about trying to get to know the person on a much deeper level. I always like to call myself um, it's, I'm like your personal interior design psychologist because I get to know you on a much deeper level. I, I tend to find out about my clients being pregnant even before maybe their parents are knowing that they're pregnant because we need to know about all these things to make the house suit them perfectly for their life now and in the future. So once we establish just all of the insights on their interests, their style, what their functional needs are from an everyday and versus entertaining perspective. We then just do a ton of research and just try to pull all the bits and pieces together and establish a really strong concept. And the concept ultimately will take us through the floor plans and all of our ideas, both the clients and maybe further developed ideas that we are bringing to the table as well. And I always like to call it like a personal interior design questionnaire because it gives me the ability to present ideas before we actually design and source. So say that, for instance, a living room is a great example where you might have this huge wall and the ability to do um, so many different things with it, it gives us a chance to be like, okay, well, do you want like the built-ins or do you just want the fireplace to be the main focal? And I'll give like a selection of options in certain areas that I see 
the ability to do different things with and and then you can have the chance to be like oh i love that i don't like that and then it ultimately establishes this direction that we then just take off with and source and design and it's always the coolest thing going back to the concept once the job is completed because it really does become become this um this bible that we follow along with along the way and it gets everyone on the same page and i think it always generates a lot of success with the designs because it's very rare we have many changes once the designs are presented because we've all been in agreement from day one of the direction we're going to take so I just love your philosophy because it really is like you're an interior design anthropologist almost because yeah. you really got to dig deep on how people live their lives. And totally. I remember some interior designers have come in here and they said, you know, you ask these questions that people are really embarrassed about, but they're like, yeah. I kind of need to know how your bathroom is set up totally. or how you do your daily routine. Yeah. And even just being able, it's I always find it interesting because no one lives perfect. Like whenever people invite us in their home for the first time, it's often a mess. It's not totally organized and that's normal but it's also really valuable for us to see that from the beginning because then it gives us a chance to see ways that maybe we can help them um in a way that works for them to hopefully set them up for success on gaining more organization in their house but not in a forced way because you can't just create a way to organize a space and it's not going to come natural to how you use and live in your house because you're going to live in your house a lot different than maybe I would live in the same house. And it's important to understand that from the beginning. Yeah. I'm curious. We talk a lot about teamwork. So when you create a concept for a space, whether yeah. you're designing how it looks or the mood or the feel, how important is the communication process you have with Matt and other builders in order to execute that? Because I feel yeah. like it can go sideways really quick if you are not both aligned, you don't have the right team of uh, people yeah. there, right? Yeah, well, I always tell my two little girls, uh, it's kind of like, it's so true though. I always say that um, dream work is teamwork and you have to have a really strong team in order to execute a successful project. And there's been times where, and I always use this reference to clients, I can uh, design the exact same home and issue the exact same spec binder and hand it off to two different builders and the outcome can be so different because it all comes down to how you work together as a team and also the trades and suppliers that maybe they end up using. And I think that's what made our job so successful is Matt did an unbelievable job on following our designs to a T. And if there was a change, the communication is so key because I see this a lot with builders and clients even. Out of nowhere, there will be a change, but then it's not brought to the designer's attention. And that's what we're here for. I, uh, If there's something that comes up. Um, I don't have to necessarily charge extra for that review. I would rather us just review to ensure that like that change is the best change it could be. And if I see any concerns, it gives us a chance to work it out and and just ensure it's it's done uh, seamlessly. And I feel like one little change can make or break a project. So it's so important to have a good team that's on the same page with good communication. Yeah, like I feel um... I feel like you did, you were quite happy with the way I executed your drawings because they're yeah. there for a reason and, and they're so detailed, yeah. like perfectly detailed. And I'm a perfectionist and so is Carly. So like we, I'd probably ask her, you know, to confirm the paint color five different times, but, and brought the swatches. And if, if there was even a change in material, I'd get the sample, I'd restain it. I'd show her three different samples. We'd work together on every single yeah. detail in that home yeah. to make it perfect the way that, well, perfect in our and that's why I yeah. think it turned out so amazing yeah because those sure. details weren't just uh yeah. quickly decided on or or mm -hmm. ignored to include everyone well yeah you don't want to come on site and there's a you know change in countertop or something because those are huge right totally and uh it's too late once it's in yeah so. and that's why you need communication yeah. and I can tell it feels like you guys have been working together for a long time but I did yeah. find out this is your first project yeah so how did you guys uh figure out that you were the two to get together and move forward um well Carly came I think yeah the clients said please, can you please interview with Carly yeah and then Carly came into our office in Port Moody and it was Carly and myself we sat down we got to know each other we, we chatted a bit and then we opened up the set of plans and we both started agreeing with the upper floor layout was 
really there was something not working yeah with the upper floor and that was primarily the kitchen yeah. being too small for this high-end multi-million dollar home mm -hmm. so i said well carly where would you where would you put it and she's like well i'd put it like here and yeah. then i started seeing her vision and the vault and the, and the view and how it was going to lay out. And I was like, that's really cool. I was like, that needs to be done. Yeah. And you need to be hired so that we can do this together. And yeah, yeah. yeah. Pretty much reworked the whole upper floor plan in the first meeting. Yeah. Maybe even the middle floor. A yeah. Bit. So when uh, my clients were telling me about the builder they wanted to work with, um, after that meeting, you guys invited me to your Uplands house. Mm -hmm. And I was really, really excited to work with Marcraft because at the time they were, uh, they had this house up on the market that they had built and it was a build to sell mm -hmm. project, right? And yeah, I was blown away by the quality of craftsmanship that they were able to execute. It was a phenomenal project, so beautiful. And I think that being able to connect yourself with people in the industry that have similar values is really important and, and valuable to have. So I was really excited to start a lasting relationship together. And hopefully, um, I was hoping that this house would be able to connect us on more and more projects to come. So yeah, and we're, I think we're both excited to work more together because it was a great project. Yeah. I'll tell you what I'm excited to do. I want to start talking about the Inlet House. But before we do that, we do have to take a short break to thank our amazing sponsors. Measure Twice, Cut Once is grateful to our podcast partners, Fortis BC, Vico Stone Canada Inc., and Trail Appliances. Support from our partners helps us share expert knowledge and resources with families looking to build, design, and renovate the home right for you. Vico Stone is renowned for providing exquisite quartz slabs, ideal for both kitchen countertops and vanities. Their extensive range caters to diverse preferences, offering everything from their versatile builder collection to the opulent and luxurious designs. Established as a reliable and preferred choice in the industry, they have earned the trust and admiration of local stone fabricators and interior designers. Trail Appliances makes everyday life better with the selection in Western Canada, hassle-free delivery, and a price match guarantee, so you always get the best deal. Trail Appliances, make sure you'll love buying an appliance as much as you'll love using it. And we all need reliable and efficient equipment for better comfort, health, and safety of our homes. Whether you want to adopt some energy saving habits or take on a major energy efficiency upgrade, no matter what your budget, Fortis PC can help you save energy. Be sure to visit fortispc.com slash rebates where you can also find amazing tips on low and no cost ways to save energy, plus buying advice for energy efficient products. All right, we are <laughs> back and now it's time to start talking about the Inlet House, AKA the winner of the best interior design custom residence. Congratulations to Thank both you. of you. I feel like we need an air horn when you say that. <laughs> <laughs> I asked, they're not, they're not letting us bring one. Um, so maybe start with Matt. Matt, can you give us a little bit of background on the project and how you got involved in the first place? So yeah, once we got chosen as a builder, um, I think they had a really good connection. The, the clients had a really good connection with my father, um, just from him being in the industry for such a long time. You know, it really goes a long ways. Um, you know, there's an instant trust and an instant sort of, uh, you know, um, sort of a feeling that, you know, this this man can do it and he's done it before. So um, especially in actually that home in Anmore too that we were able to walk them Which was through. gorgeous. I've been through it. Yeah, we're actually <laughs> actually walk, walk them through that to show them what kind of quality of home we can build. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we had this, then we get this set of plans that came with the lot. So the lot was purchased and a set of plans were already drawn up for the home, for that lot, sorry. Um, so looking at the plans, um, that was basically at that time met Carly and um, we started getting into it. But where the challenge really came into play was uh, the geotechnical um, stability of the actual land itself. Um, because we're building on the ocean, it was like building on a sandbox essentially. And if you keep digging, you're not going to find any bearing. You're just going to find sand and sand and sand and water. And water was coming literally as we were excavating, coming out of the mountainside. Right. So huge issue with trying to like, you know, stabilize the bank, shoring, shotcrete, piles, huge pad footings, tons of rebar. Never put so much rebar in, in a build <laughs> ever. Um, and honestly, yeah, like, you know, a 40 foot 
basically digging down a 40 foot grade from the street level to the ocean. And when the excavator is digging and water is coming out, you're really worried about that entire bank or mountain coming in at you. Yeah. So it's a very dangerous situation and also, you know, very unexpected um, geotechnical conditions that we had to like really challenging um, feet to take over. So mm-hmm. is that common for waterfront properties or it's, is that, you, you is know, that a one off? It's a honestly situation? a luck. It's, it's a bit of a luck of the draw because with geotechnical lands, it could be an old river creek it could be it could be a dried up riverbed it could be waters coming off the mountain in different areas has a path one one situation the neighboring property could be totally different so in that situation you don't know Mm -hmm. um in other areas such as west vancouver and stuff like that you could it looks like nice soil you dig down three four feet you hit rock now you're blasting and blasting could be like you know ten thousand dollars a day if not more for machinery. So that adds up really quick. Mm -hmm. Um, and just having piling is going to add up huge. So really knowing what's kind of below the surface as maybe even a condition, not even maybe, but as a condition of a purchase of some land is a really good advice to, to make sure you know what you're going to be building on. Mm -hmm. And Matt, you're a realtor. So this is Mm kind of your wheelhouse as well. Do you have a lot of people when you're on the realtor side, kind of asking you those questions or wanting to do their due diligence before they purchase and then possibly build? No, unfortunately not because they've already either bought the land and then they're like going, I want to build this home. And, but they don't know what they're currently building on. Most of the time they don't even know what the city will allow them to build. Mm Mm-hmm. So I do feel that there needs to be a lot more education with like, you know, what the municipality is going to allow them to build everyone and and more knowledge on what what they could do with their actual physical land. Mm -hmm. Setbacks, a lot of things. Trees, you can't just cut trees down. They mostly have to stay. Mm -hmm. You know, that could be a problem. Um, How do you estimate something like that? Because what you said, it sounds like you have to do a whole bunch of stuff and you're sort of mitigating it as you go along. How do you manage that for for expect both for expectations of budget and just managing the budget in general? Because ultimately, as the builder, you're the one who manages and is responsible for that budget, right? Well, yeah, it's, and it's a real challenge because you know what you're trying to do is gather as much information um, when you're when you want to present a budget to clients, and there's a lot of unknowns, right? So, like I was saying, the geotechnical stuff, you have to get into the structural design. Um, everyone wants an open concept plan nowadays and that involves a ton of steel and steel and wood and windows you know all that stuff kind of you know the days of framing a home is no longer now you're mostly having like a steel structure with some some elements of wood right so that that adds a a totally different trade to the whole scope of the project right um in the bigger picture just trying to get all the information in the right amount of time because in real estate you can only have subjects for so long as well to do your due diligence. Mm -hmm. So there's a short time window and you can't get all your answers. And so there's a real challenge there, Mm -hmm. right? It's almost a bit of a gamble when you- It it definitely can be a gamble, Mm -hmm. right? And then as you go, you're finding more and more information out. And when I was talking about setbacks, there could be municipalities, uh, you know, there's course of, there could be an old creek that Mm -hmm. may be, you know, registered on, on the land and you can't build near that. So, Tons and tons of things that you need to learn, and every municipality has their own challenges. Or like yeah. you said, trees too are a big one as well. A lot of yeah. people think like they'll see a property and they're like, oh, I can knock those trees and make my place bigger. And Definitely, it's like, yeah. no, you can't. Exactly. <laughs> You've got to put it around it. So it's just mm-hmm. nice to have someone like you that kind of has both mm-hmm. knowledges. Because like I said, that's very rare. You mm-hmm. usually have the building expert and then the real estate expert. And for some reason, they don't do too much collab with each mm-hmm. other. Mm-hmm. And I feel like they could really benefit each other. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, even the services of a city, water, storm, sewer, Yeah. you know, most likely if you're going to be knocking down a home, you're going to be upgrading the services Mm -hmm. to that property. That's a lot of money. That could be like 30, 40,000, if not more dollars to the city on top of your demo budget and your asbestos removal budget, just to even get the home to a point where you have bare land to build on. And depending on what municipality and you can't demo anymore, you got to destruct. Yes. Yeah. Well, and and recycle. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that can be more expensive as well. More labor, more time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Recycle properly. 
The good news is as the cost of building goes up, the quality of building science is also increasing and the energy efficiency is also increasing. So it's not like we're not getting anything for it. We're getting a great return on our investment, but we're still having to deal with this. It's now, more complicated. Quick nowadays. question. Mm -hmm. This house was purchased with plans and then you redesigned those plans. Can we ask mm -hmm. why that might be? Yeah, so uh, because the property was purchased with architectural plans, uh, they basically had to work with what they had and they wanted to work with what they had. But the thing that was really interesting was the home was reflecting an ultra modern design, like very, very modern. And when I first met with them, they had requested for it to be nothing like a modern design. They wanted it to be a lot more timeless with more of a Hamptons feel. And my first question was, okay, are we going to get the architect to redo these? And they're like, nope, we got to work with it. So that was one of the biggest challenges I had on the project was right from the beginning, trying to somehow add the character to this modern structure. So in some ways, it almost was like we were uh, doing a renovation on a new build because we we really had to think outside the box with this existing slate. So a lot of the ways we were able to successfully um, achieve that is simply through evaluating uh, well, especially the exterior. This was probably the first time I've spent this much time on the exterior design because for the most part for exterior design, we will help with like the finishing and whatnot. But I really got involved with the architectural details to another level. So um, we really paid attention to elements that we could add to just give that extra character to this existing slate. So one of the things that we did was we proposed beams because at first it's kind of, the roof line was almost like this V shape. So going out on each end, the roof line went up and then it came down in the middle. But before there was nothing, it was just soffit. So we added uh, beams just to give it a little bit more character and depth. And we really were selective on our finishes to tone down that modernism. So we add, we added uh, uh, shakes to the exterior siding. Uh, we it was actually a lot of fun doing the conceptual design because we ended up doing a lot of research on the water. Like we took a boat out a ton and. We're looking at all these different properties on the on that water line just to see what everyone's doing and what could we do different to stand out. But also like the majority of the newer homes were all just clean glass and everything is modern, but we didn't want that. So what we did instead was we did add a railing and post system, but with a glass insert. And it was just to help, of course, let the light through and not block the view, but of course, add a little bit of that extra detail and lighting was a huge huge detail that really helped add to the character of the home we it's probably one of my favorite lighting packages we've done and uh, i think that's almost one of the biggest showstoppers of the home when you walk through the lighting just gives brings out so much character and stimulates so much interest and everyone always comments on the lighting it's just it's really stunning yeah what's but, unique about the lighting like oh, can you describe it so paint cool. a photo <laughs> yeah it's so cool yeah we um, so every patio there's three uh patios and every level we took a different approach so the top level we really grounded that by having this repetition in the same pendant that was seen and it was like a wicker pendant and they look so beautiful like when you're there at the house the sea just like the breeze from the sea just naturally sways the light and it just feels so peaceful watching that um the and then every level we just really tried to embrace what the purpose of that patio was uh, but also in a way where when you're looking at it from the water it was important to create a balance all at the same time so we did a little bit of like counterbalancing uh, where some configurations were offset with one another and then the top was a little bit more symmetrical and yeah and then one thing that's really cool too about the home is uh, the the top floor which is uh, way higher ceilings than the rest we created a little bit more of like a lighter um, ambiance through the, a lot of the finishes, but the staircase is really open concept and 
it basically is just open to the basement but we wanted to create like a different mood as you went down to the different floors so uh, a huge part of that was achieved with lighting as well where on the top level you don't really see touches of black but as you move down into the basement you see little touches of uh, black elements through the lighting and then on the main level, well, I should say the mid-level, mm -hmm. where all the sleeping areas are, there's a little bit more color play and drama scene. And then as you move down into the basement, it's there's a lot more mood and drama through the fixtures and finishes. But there's just a different feel through the lighting. And I think the lighting just really helps connect and embrace how each area of the space feels. Yeah. I mean, what I appreciate about the lighting is um, it was not like there was like there's zero pot lights. Right. So yeah. you look at some of these houses and you go, oh, my gosh, I feel so sorry for the neighbors. Right. Because it's just pot lights everywhere. Yeah. There were no pot lights right these are all hanging pendant fixtures so when you see it at night it's just got like a nice glow to it mm -hmm. right on every level but yeah. it's not like from the ocean i mean we did some beautiful landscape lighting and some step lighting yeah but just looking back from the ocean it's just so organic and just and not overdone which yeah. i think is nice it's very like very tasteful yeah and i think that's that's a good point because i feel like and we try to do this through our designs um where when you walk through the home from start to finish, even if there's different vibes going on in different spaces, you still want it to like effortlessly feel connected and and you're not like sh caught off guard in a way where it's like, whoa, like this is kind of random. It all flows where it makes sense and you subconsciously feel like it's a natural flow. And I feel like even from the water, when you look at the home, it's not like it's perfectly f put together in this structured format. It's done... In, and I feel like casual elegance is such an appropriate way to uh, explain the design of the home because it really does have that reflection in almost everything through the selections of the finishes and just the way it's kind of effortlessly put together in an organic way. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, that was always sort of my principle as well. It's like, you know, you want to walk through a home and you want to see the same elements throughout the home. On different levels mm -hmm. but you don't want to walk into each every room and every powder room with a different theme and a, you know everything's a different theme you sort of get confused mm -hmm. and at the end of the day you actually it's not a comfortable feeling it's all just supposed to work together as as yeah. one mm -hmm. right you guys paint such a great photo i actually feel like i'm walking through mm -hmm. the house so you guys are <laughs> so great at mm -hmm. describing i just want to go back to plans again for a second because you touched upon something man i was curious so the home came with plans so they've obviously whoever owned the home first went to the architect and everything like that mm -hmm. um the architects do have some structural knowledge and obviously know what they can mm -hmm. and cannot design so wouldn't that have been taken into account then when they drew up the plans or was it no, just so long because ago or at that time I, we there was no engineer on board yet oh, okay. so just architecturals yeah so then the then the uh, engineer has to go wow okay so i have an entire back elevation of glass with no wall structure so that's called moment frame and with moment frame that's where all the beams and steel beams and columns because to keep the whole thing rigid it has to be welded so that entire back elevation was a tower of steel wow right and and all welded together from the bottom and then the base and the geotechnical and the um, structural um, engineer work together. And unfortunately, the architect, yes, they have some principle, but they they don't do this structural. So See, and that's the hard thing because yeah. I, I thought too, and yeah. I'm from the construction industry, that I think a lot of people, you know, buying homes that maybe don't have the knowledge in mm -hmm. this industry are like, oh, I got plans with the home. That's going to save yeah. me money. But then they don't realize like, okay, well, I haven't talked to a builder about it yet. Right. They must cover yeah. everything and include absolutely everything, right? I, Their plans. Yes. Yeah. I think, I think, I think, yeah, yeah to, to have a architectural is one thing, but structural is just as important mm -hmm. for sure. And to figure start figuring out costs. Yeah. I mean, the, the roof line on this, like Carly mentioned, I mean, it cantilevered out on an angle <laughs> and shot out like, probably 12 feet on one end and six on the other. And it was like this. So, I mean, even that itself, that roof line, I mean, it was insane. It was mm -hmm. just, uh, it was quite the challenge. It, it looked, it looked cool. It just, it was challenging. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you guys talked about engineers and other people in the project. The um, energy specialist is a huge part of the equation now. When you guys switch from an open concept modern design to a slightly different design, what did that do to your energy efficiency of the home and what changes were required to maintain whatever levels you were planning at before? Because 
that's a huge well, part of our conversation, now, especially with step code changing. So yeah, nowadays this this would have been way more challenging with the with the step codes. Um, so at the time, I we uh, you know with all that glass and stuff, it, it, we didn't have to model it to the same regulations as now. So we're actually able to achieve that look, but now less windows, probably more insulation, smaller windows. I mean, there is a way around that too by getting like triple pane and the energy efficiency of the actual window and door package. But I mean, you have to model these homes completely now and and then run the energy test. And that was not done, didn't need to be done at the time at this home. So you were actually, you know, it's like the old days, you just like glass everywhere, just go for it. But it feels like with less glass, it's going to be easier to yeah. manage anyway, yeah. right? But this glass that we did get was triple pane and is super efficient. And um, so that did really help. And uh, Is it know, reflective in any way or is it straight? It's, re straight, it's reflective, um, the glass itself? Yeah. Yeah, it is. And the, I mean, low E glass and argon filled in between layers. Um, but also like, you know, spray foam, we use a lot of that um, throughout the home under the slab and the walls and the roof structure. I mean, a lot of, a lot of, um, you know, time and attention was put into, you know, keeping it, the energy in and not out. So. Besides the lighting, because I'm always curious for both of you, what is your favorite part of this house? Do you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> I, d I know mine. I, my, well, my favorite, do you want me to go? Yeah. Yeah. My favorite is for sure the ensuite because it's, uh, I feel like there's, there's actually quite a few elements where we were able to like elevate the experience of bringing the outdoors in, but especially in the ensuite because, um, they, we basically through our floor plan critique, we proposed the idea of changing what was just a fixed window in front of the tub to instead be a folding glass system. So the whole ball opens up. And when you're in your tub having a bath, you literally are like having a bath on your deck, looking out oh, to the ocean. Cool. And it's one of my favorite features. It's just so mm -hmm. blissful. I wish I could be there all the time. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess no one really can see you because you're on the water. <laughs> so you can't like, I mean, if boats were there, maybe they could see, but my client was just like, I don't even care. It's, a, like, deep, it's, it's a deep cut tub. It's a, yeah. Oh, okay. And, and there's blinds. But you yeah, got to use sunscreen, right? On a remote. You might, so I once you're in. Yeah, you, you might want some sunscreen yeah. for that. <laughs> sunscreen. Once you're in, then you, open, then you the open the window. The, yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Blind, open the blinds once you're in. Yeah. Or yeah. well, you might start a boat crash. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Like, <laughs> but it's yeah. unbelievable. Like, it's just, I feel like that's just another level of luxury, being able to have that ability, you know? Yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. But, yeah. I didn't even know that was such a thing. I want one now. I know. Yeah. I, yeah. I would have to say for me, it's the kitchen. It's just like, it's one of the most beautiful kitchens I've ever seen. Um, and what makes it unique is just like the floor to ceiling cabinets on like a vaulted angle and, and it's all white and a beautiful marble backsplash and um, just the appliances. The stove itself is like a, a showstopper. Oh, yeah. Um, and it's like, it's not a huge kitchen, but it's super functional. Yeah. And I love the seating. Uh, it's a huge island. I just, I, I just, I love the chairs and I love the pendants over the island. It's just something like, yeah, it's just a spectacular kitchen. Yeah. And yeah. I, I actually wouldn't mind touching on that because one thing that was also unique about the floor plans was the, uh, like, again, during the floor plan critique, we were really trying to assess this layout because at the time we saw that there was like potential for reworking the layout in the main living area. And at the for the original drawing set, the kitchen was pushed into the back of the house, like Matt was saying. And uh, with that roof line, it would have resulted in you having a kitchen with also a very low ceiling height when the rest of the mm -hmm. space was very elevated. Mm -hmm. So we proposed to switch it all around and where the dining room was, which no one uses that much of. I feel like you spend the majority of the time in your living room and your kitchen. Mm -hmm and dining room just for eating. So we thought that would be a lot more beneficial to put the dining room back in the house and then uh, just make sure the front of the, where I guess the the best view line would be, would be for dedicated for the living room and the kitchen. And we took it another step further where we really tried to, uh, I guess, embrace 
the view and how the view operates. So thinking about where the sun sets at night was an important factor to determine where the kitchen was positioned and where the living room was positioned because in the original set, the living room was where the kitchen is and it would result in you having your back to the most epic sunset mm -hmm. at nighttime when you're probably sitting down watching TV. So we felt it was essential to swap that around and it works out perfect because the sink is on the island. So whether you're cooking or you're relaxing in the living room during the best point of, of the day where the sun is setting and that's like where you get that elevation of the multi-million dollar view, you're always going to be facing that point. So those are like important factors with design too. It's not just about creating a beautiful space. It's not just about creating a functional space. It's really also embracing your surroundings and the natural habitat that you're located in and, and making sure it's utilizing that in the best possible way as well. So again, that's why you have to have a great interior designer and builder because they'll help point out those things to you yeah. too. Yeah. Because if you don't know what you're doing, you're not going to be able to tell them, well, you're going to miss that epic sunset. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're going to build their home and they're going to be like, oh, wait, that beautiful sunset now is at my back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and you also have to trust your team. Like we as homeowners think, oh, we want this, this place and that, that place, right? We go to professionals for a reason and we yeah. have to let them do their job to get those kind of results. Now, I'm going to be honest, I could keep talking about this all afternoon, <laughs> but we have to wrap up, unfortunately. But before we do, I just want to go down some of the lessons that we learned today and some of the challenges presented. Because I think for the people watching and listening, these are especially like the meat and potatoes of all of this. And because whether they're building a large home on the water or a house anywhere, the lessons learned mm -hmm. are the lessons learned. And we talked about a lot of really cool stuff, translating ultra modern plans into a traditional Hampton style. And that's a challenge, but working with a great designer obviously leads to great results. Um, we talked about better use of views and improved livability. And when you're working with the right designer, you get the right outcome. And the designer has the personal knowledge and, and the idea of how the lighting and the area should all go together in terms of implementing the details as well. And finally, we talked about the ocean front and the lack of stability and the importance of having time taken to find out what's underneath before you begin, right? That's called doing your due diligence. And again, working with a great builder who brings in great professionals and great team members to deal with those issues is how you get around it. So, so much great information that we went over today and I just really appreciate both of you telling this story. It's been phenomenal and as always, very, very inspiring. Oh, thank you. Well, it's been so nice and I'm honored to be here. So thank you for including us. We're really happy to have you here and it's so great to see you again, Matt. Um, before you go, I know you've said so many great little pieces mm -hmm. of wisdom, but can you each give us one different piece of wisdom for potential homeowners that maybe you haven't covered yet that are thinking to build or obviously hire an interior designer? Um, I could start maybe. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's one thing that I still want to dive into and there's this whole cost per square foot conversation. Oh. And um, I shudder as a builder. Don't yeah. <laughs> and like I, I, it just, it makes zero, zero sense to me. Um, there's no way that you can, um, it, it's one, one size of shoe doesn't fit all, you know, like there's, there's no, there's no way around it. Um, every individual lot has an individual challenges. Every municipality has its own regulations. Every single home is different because it's custom. So there is no blanket cost per square foot that would make any sense. So just do your due diligence, get all the information, all the information then could be out for bid. And then you could assess the bid. And if there is changes that need to be made, it should happen prior to the start of construction, not during or not, you know, a month into it, you know, do all your homework, take the time. And sometimes everyone's in a rush to get something done. But in reality, the more time you take from the beginning to do it right and know what you're up against, you're going to thank yourself because once you can sign off on the dotted line, and then you can move forward and there'll be minor changes, but it will not be like anything catastrophic. Mm -hmm. So, so be realistic about your budget, about your timing. Don't rush the process and, and the cost per square foot is not really a good base to start with. Mm -hmm. And for me, I would, I feel like one of the most valuable tools, uh, to do a successful design 
whether you're hiring a designer or if you're even trying to tackle a project on your own, is to always start with a really strong conceptual design direction. Because if you don't have that to begin with, I feel like it could be a bit of a, it could end a little messy. And whether or not, like say that you don't have a concept with your designer, who knows what you're getting presented with and who knows how many changes that might result in. Um, if you're doing a project on your own, I think the the best value for having that concept is it allows cohesiveness through your own selections, but also if you're going to be involving other people in the mix, whether like, so for instance, I get this a ton where maybe some budget friendly clients are needing just a little bit of assistance, but they can't afford um, to hire a designer. So we always encourage, okay, well, let's help you with the concept because that's going to act as your guide. You're going to be able to take that to your mill worker who then could hopefully put together some successful shop drawings that complement the direction you're after. And when you have all these cooks in the kitchen, if they have this plan, that's just a conceptual plan to follow as a guide, hopefully it can help in achieving a cohesive home and it will allow you to just stay on track with your vision and feel confident in the selections that you make moving forward. So, yeah. Perfect. Well, yeah. thank you guys so much. Phenomenal conversation about working with a great builder and working with a great designer to create a great home. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about something really important. Once that great home is completed, it most assuredly needs a barbecue. <laughs> and if that's you, boy, have we got something you're going to like. You see, because you listen to this episode, because you like this episode, you can now win a Napoleon Prestige P500 stainless steel natural gas barbecue valued at over $1,500, compliments of our podcast partners of Fortis BC. All you got to do is go to haven.ca slash measure twice, cut once, and you too could be in the winner's circle with a new barbecue for your new home overlooking the water. <laughs> and how many times have you entered, Mike? All of them, but they won't let me win. <laughs> will they let us win? <laughs> Unfortunately not, but one lucky listener will win. And for notes and links to everything mentioned on today's episode, including resources shared by Matt and Carly and see some amazing photos of their award winner, go to haven.ca slash measure twice, cut once. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.